Well, good morning, everybody. It's actually good to be with you today. In fact, it's just good to be upright, as uh, Van mentioned before. Uh, I'm, I'm still not 100% after having come down with COVID about 10, 11 days ago. And um, some people, they get sort of the mild symptoms. This had me flat on my back for several days. And um, I was just saying the things that some people do to get some sleep. So it, was, it's, I, I, it will take it, but that sleep took its toll on me. So, um, so I just want to ask your forgiveness at once. I still have a little bit of, it's in my chest. And so if I hack right in the middle of it, um, yeah, turn to each other and pray for me. Um, but hopefully it won't be that bad. My wife gave me this wonderful concoction of, of lemon and honey water. At least she said it was wonderful. I thought it tasted nasty. So I, I decided just to bring up old normal water here. So hopefully that will be good. But. Well, we are in our final two Sundays of our little mini-series on the book of Psalms. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, as, as we've mentioned, Psalms is it's a book of songs and poetry. It's a book full of nice, beautiful, flowery language. Sometimes it's not always that beautiful. Sometimes it's kind of mean and vindictive, as, as, as the psalmist reaches out to God about his situation. Um, but it's full of emotions. It's full of metaphors and similes and hyperbole and, you know, putting human characteristics on inhuman things. And, and it's one of those books that it's easy to relate to, but sometimes hard to really understand. So I, I, I hope you've had a chance to really get into it and, and enjoy it. Um, I have had a pattern for a number of years that in my morning uh, devotion time that I would read five psalms a day. Since there's 150 chapters, I would read, like, today being, what, I don't know what day of the month it is, the 31st. So this, it's an odd day, so this doesn't count. But it's like on the 1st, tomorrow I would read the 1st, the 31st, the 61st, 91st, and 120. Um, so today would be a day off. <laughs> Excuse me. But anyway, it's, a, it's just a great way to get into the book of Psalms. And, and you can get through the entire book in the course of a month if you do something like that. But, um, all right, so I want you to finish this phrase for me. The nice guy finishes last. It's awful, right? That's an, that's an awful thing. But we know that phrase because, unfortunately... We've seen it to be true firsthand. Uh, in this cutthroat world in which we live, you know, in this business world where there's lots of competition, where people are trying to make a name for themselves and get ahead, it seems like being kind and nice is almost viewed like a weakness. Um, but people feel this need to constantly exploit the little guy. Uh, to take advantage of the system and, and do whatever it takes to get ahead. Now, obviously, not everybody's like that, right? Hopefully, most of us are not like that in the way that we deal with people and the way that we deal with the world. But often it seems that being a good person and doing the right thing just doesn't win. So why is it that... You know, the disgusting, sexist pig seems to be the one that succeeds in the workplace. They are the ones with the upward mobility. Why is it that, that drug dealers, people who are ruining other people's lives, are able to walk free and drive nice cars and have money available to them? The Kardashians. Why? Alec Baldwin, RuPaul, Hunter Biden, Johnny Depp, Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins. Why? Just about anybody in national politics. Why? 
Why does it seem like the gates of hell are standing in opposition to everything that we know to be good and true? And it seems that at times they're winning. How is it that wicked and godless people succeed? And why does God at times seem to be just standing idly on the sidelines? Well, these aren't new questions. There are a number of psalms that deal with this particular issue, and we're going to look at one of them today. So if you have your Bibles, uh, and I hope you do, whether it's you know, the hard copy or electronic version, please turn to Psalm chapter 10. And we're going to look at that question as to why the wicked prosper. So as you're turning there, just Pray with me for a minute, please. Father, we come before you today thankful uh, that we have a chance to meet together as a church. Uh, That as we've already prayed, that we have this opportunity to set aside time in our week just to, to reset, to get a fresh and renewed perspective on uh, who we are, who you are, how you operate, how we need to respond to you. And so God, I pray that this morning that you would uh, remind us that in the midst of this chaotic world that we live in, that, that you are a good God who's who's in control. Uh, But in addition to that, God, you have given us a job to do. And so, God, motivate us, teach us, uh, convict us where we need to be. Uh, We know that you are here in our presence already, but we invite you to to take hold of our hearts today, uh, really, and to shape us into the, the church that you would have us to be. So may my words be your words. And in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So as you're turning there uh, to the 10th Psalm, um, just a bit of some notes. The 10th Psalm is related very closely to the 9th Psalm. Uh, both address the, the same theme, same topic of injustice in the world. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say, as some people do, that it is a continuation of the 9th Psalm. Um, uh, you'd see in the header of the ninth psalm that that in and of itself is, was intended to be a song. It was intended to be sung to a certain tune. Um, the tenth one doesn't have such a header. Um, it's written in a slightly different structure, more, more poetically, more of a psalm, uh, a poem in that regard. So, um, but it is continuing on with, uh, the same theme, uh, as the ninth psalm. It's kind of like, you know, some authors like to write different pieces on a similar topic. And that's really what's happening here is that uh, a topic is just being carried over and written about in a, in a different way. Martin Luther talked about this psalm, Psalm 10, very specifically by saying that there is not a psalm which describes the mind, the manners, the works, the words, the feelings, and the fate of the ungodly with so much propriety, fullness, and light as this psalm, as Psalm 10. So if you really want to get into the mind of a wicked person, of the, of the people that are ruling this world today, you just have to look at Psalm 10. So that's what we're going to do today. So if you wouldn't mind... Just stand with me, and we're all going to read this together uh, off of what's on the screen. Um, And just so I can save my voice, I'm just going to let you guys read it um, and go from there. So I'll get it started. So why, Lord? You stand.
person's face and of their seeds. Christ, Lord, lift up your hand. Do not forget the helpless. For I am the wicked man in the bottom of God. Christ, as he saved himself, he would walk all the way to God. It would be you, God, and see their trouble and be afflicted. Consider their grief. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, now probably all of you now have a raspy voice and need to go get something to drink. But. So why do the wicked prosper? And why isn't God doing something about it? The prophet Jeremiah wrestled with this question when he asked God directly, why does the wicked, why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all the faithless live at ease? You have planted them, and they have taken root. They grow and bear fruit. You are always on their lips, but you are far from their hearts. Job, who tragically lost everything, as we know his story, wondered, why do the wicked live on, growing old and increasing in power? And as I said before, several other psalms deal with this very question. Why does a loving God allow people to suffer while wicked people seem to thrive? Now there's no indicator in this psalm that the psalmist himself is the one being oppressed. The way that it reads is that he is the one who's just observing the oppression that is going on in this wicked world. And so rather than just starting in verse 1 and going verse by verse uh, and, and starting there where the psalmist asks the question why, I want to start with what he sees, what he sees playing out around him. So I want to start by looking at the routines of the wicked. So if you're taking notes, those are the first few blanks that you can fill in. It's the routines of the wicked. So the first thing that wicked people do, according to this section, according to the psalmist's observations, is that they live as if God does not exist. In verse 4, it says, The wicked man does not seek him, does not seek God. In all of his thoughts, there is no room for God. Some of our translations actually say that all of his thoughts are, there is no God. Further down in, in verse 5, it says that, that the wicked man rejects all of the laws of God. So in other words, they live like they're practical atheists. They know that he exists. They know that his laws exist. They see his order in creation. They understand his goodness, as we talked about just even a few weeks ago, with, in looking at creation. That they see God's handiwork. They know that he exists. But they operate as if he doesn't. As if his laws don't apply to them. As Dostoevsky said in his book, The Brothers Karamazov, which is my favorite uh, fiction book of all time. It took me five years to get through it, but it's still my favorite book to get through. But Dostoevsky said, if there is no God then everything is permitted. And that's how the wicked live. 
In other words, if there is no God, there is no ultimate justice. And if there is no ultimate justice, there's no reason to fear punishment, either in this life or in the afterlife. And in that case, you can do whatever you want to whoever you want, however you want to do it. Because it doesn't matter in the end. Someone else put it this way. If there is no God, then we cannot be made in his image. Therefore, we cannot be his children. And in that case, there is nothing which is wrong to do to a human being simply because they are human. If we believe or act, and certainly if the world believes or acts as if there is no God, then nothing is off limits. It's no holds barred. And so the wicked people of this world can you wonder, how, how on earth do they have the audacity to do that? It's because they don't live their life as if God exists. And if the God doesn't exist to them, then it doesn't matter. There's no one there to hold them accountable. And that really is the second thing, second routine of the wicked, is that they think that they will not be held accountable. And it starts there in verse 3 where it says, they brag about the cravings of their heart. Wicked people have no shame when it comes to their sin. In fact, they brag about their sin. You know, we see that all too well in our culture today. Things that were once understood to be wrong and shameful are now loudly and proudly celebrated in the streets. We have men who would brag about the number of women that they've slept with. We have people who identify themselves with their behavioral choices and their appetites. And I don't just mean their, their deviance or, or sexual appetites or things like that, but, but even the materialistic cravings of their hearts. You know, this might sting a little bit of it because this is true in the church sometimes too. That people are constantly bragging about their, their cravings, their, maybe it's their purchases, their latest technology that they got, the newest fashion, or they do some virtual signaling about the certain cause that they're upholding or the uh, certain way in which they're, they're uh, fitting in within uh, the correctness of our culture. But the psalmist here goes on to say that the wicked person, not only does he brag about his cravings, but then he goes on to say that oh, nothing's ever going to shake me. I'm invincible. No one's ever going to do me harm. Nothing bad will ever happen to me. Kind of sounds a little bit like a teenager. Right? At least my teenage boy sometimes just thinks that he's invincible. That's sort of what's at the heart of, of, uh, of a, a wicked person is they do things and they don't get caught. And it, it emboldens them to do more. That ah, nothing's going to happen. And when God doesn't immediately respond, when justice isn't immediately served, they become more bro bold and brazen in their sin. The psalmist declares, the evil person believes that he will get away with his crimes. In verse 11, he says that God will not notice. At least that's the claim of the wicked person. God's not looking. God's not going to notice. God's covering his face. He's not going to see it. That's, that's a pretty bold statement there because either he's implying that God is willfully ignorant, he's painfully neglectful, 
Or at worst, he's semi-complicit because he's just turning a blind eye. He knows it's happening, but he's not going to do anything about it. Then take it down just a couple of other verses. Verse 13, it says, The wicked person arrogantly says to himself that God will not hold him to account. People who get away with things think they're going to get away with things forever. So the routines of the wicked are that they live as if God doesn't exist. They think that they will not be held accountable. And then the third one is they pursue all forms of evil. And in some ways this is just a very a sweeping category of some of the, the, the descriptions that are there. But if you look at some of the general descriptors there in verses 7 through 11, and it depends on your translation, but there's cursing, there's deceit, there's oppression, there's mischief, wickedness, ambush, murder. <coughs> he has sneak attacks to take advantage of the weak, the unfortunate, and the afflicted. You know, in this passage, uh, the psalmist uses the metaphor of a lion lying in wait. A little bit different than how we use it uh, earlier today in our songs. But this is a lion who's in wait, in, lying in wait to catch his prey. You know, when a lion is on the hunt, something is going to die. The Dictionary of Biblical Imagery says that the lion here is metaphorically the embodiment of evil. The lion is malicious in his action. He's premeditated in his harm. And he's ruthlessly efficient in killing. So the wicked people, it's not just a heart attitude in it. It's not just their, their boldness in it, but there's just, it encompasses a whole variety of different ways in which, which they will revile God and his laws and oppress people for their own advantage. And so this is the wicked. This is the world in which we live in. We've all seen this, right? So like we all have come across people like this, whether personally or in the news or anything else like that. This is the world that we live in. But it leads very naturally to the questions that the psalmist asks at the very beginning. And so the second thing here is in addition to the routines of the wicked, we get to the the reactions of the righteous. Now, I'm not saying that these are always the reactions that righteous people have. Nor am I actually saying that these reactions are necessarily in and of themselves righteous reactions. But these are normal reactions in the face of injustice in the world. And so I'm going to give you two of them. The first one is, they question God's inaction. Verse 1, why, O Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? He's asking, God, I'm looking at all this, and why aren't you doing something? It's a normal reaction. When we see an accident on the side of the road... Or a disturbance in some place. Or some kind of crisis in the news. It's normal for us to ask, where are the police? What are they doing about this? We're taught to look for the person in charge. Right? We look for the person with the authority and the ability to step up and to step in and to get something done. The one exception to that is when someone says, I'm from the government and I'm here to help, right? You know, we, we all know that a smart person knows just to keep looking for, for somebody else to do something. But 
There's no indicator again in this passage that, that the psalmist is arrogantly asking as if he knows better. As if he has this attitude of, well, if I were God, I would have done something by now. Now, sometimes we go there in our thoughts, and sometimes we go there in our questions, but I don't see that as what the psalmist is doing here in this situation. But sometimes we do go so far to accuse God and say, it's your fault. You let this happen. Notice here in this that the psalmist isn't asking, God, where are you? Although, again, sometimes we do that as well. We ask, God, where, where are you in the midst of this? You know, God, you, I feel like you left me hanging here. You didn't show up. You know, and sometimes we say, you know, don't tell me that those footprints in the sands were you carrying me, right? Sometimes we just think, that's me all by myself. So, God, where are you? But I don't see that here in the psalm. There's no indicator that the psalmist has taken that approach. If you think of other psalms that, you're, or that, uh, that you might have read or, or been aware of, in Psalm 46, the psalmist recognized that God is an ever-present help in times of trouble. He, he recognizes that God is always there. And in Psalm 139, David actually writes, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. The writer's theology informs him that God was there and that he is aware and was aware of what's going on. His theology also informs him that, that God is a God of justice and that he wouldn't let the wicked go unpunished. But he is rightfully looking to say, all right, God, this is happening we need you to intervene. And why haven't you done that yet? What we believe about God sometimes does not match up with what's happening in our life, though, right? Next Sunday, it will be eight years since our son Joseph passed away. And you can be sure that it was a long time before the textbook answers about God really felt like they were true uh, as we were dealing with that grief. You know, those, those textbook answers really quite were, weren't quite in sync with our emotions or how I felt about God in those moments. And of all the cards that we received uh, during that time, the most poignant of them was written by a friend of ours who said, my prayer for you is that what you believe and know to be true about God and your emotions will soon be in alignment with each other. Sometimes our emotions and our theology don't line up. But it's not the theology that has changed. It's our emotions that have drifted. And we need to kind of get to a point where our emotions are back in alignment with what we know to be true about God. It's very possible the next Sunday I'm going to need some of you to remind me of that again. But as Charles Spurgeon put it, he said, The presence of God is the joy of his people. But any suspicion of his absence is distracting beyond measure. It's not the trouble, but the hiding of our Father's face, which cuts us to the quick. Sometimes we feel like, yeah, we can get through this, but 
it hurts at times when we think that God hasn't quite intervened on us, on our behalf, like we expect him to. And sometimes the fault in our emotions is that our expectations really aren't quite in alignment with what is true about God as well. Well, I can go on and on about this for a little bit. I'll just say the second reaction of the righteous is that they call for God's justice. Verse 12, the psalmist says, lift up your hand, God. Say, please take action. Verse 15, it says, break the arm of the wicked. Call the evildoers to account for his wickedness. Now, I'll I'll just, a little side note here, that break the arm of the wicked, that sounds a bit vengeful, right? It sounds like, you know, I don't want just justice. I I, I kind of want a little bit of revenge, too. I really could spend an entire sermon, an entire series, talking about these types of vindictive reactions in the Psalms, because there's, there's a bunch of them. But there really is that fine line between wanting justice and wanting revenge. And since we don't have the time to actually go into it now, I'll say this. C.S. Lewis, in his uh, book, Reflections on the Psalms, does an excellent job of addressing um, how we can look at those things. But suffice it to say for now that this is just a very poetic way. Again, remember, Psalms is a book of poems. Poems use colorful language. It uses um, hyperbole and other things. But this is just a very poetic way of saying, God, we need you to immobilize these evil evildoers. Stop them in their tracks, God. And the purpose of calling for God's justice isn't necessarily so that they will be punished. But in verse 18, it says, so that they will never strike terror again. We want God's justice so that the the behaviors will stop. Yes. We also want them to turn and repent. And rather than taking matters into our own hands, God's people appeal to him to take action and provide the ultimate justice. And our hearts are so that they would turn toward him. Now, I said that that I have two reactions to the righteous, but I'm actually going to give you a third one. So this one's free, no extra charge here. But you don't have notes for this or blanks in your notes for this. But since it's here in the passage, I would be remiss if I left it out. So, So you can add letter C to this, the third reaction of the righteous is that they commit themselves to the Lord. In verse 14, it says, the victim commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. That no matter what happens, whether they are victims of the abuse or the oppression, or whether they're just burdened by the oppression that they observe in the world, rather than giving in or giving up or taking the mentality of, if, well, if you can't beat them, join them. Instead, the righteous people commit themselves to God, to his protection, to his way of doing things, and to his promises. They keep on in faith, they trust in him, they are faithful and obedient even when the world is going to hell in a handbasket. So we've seen the the routines of the wicked, the reactions of the righteous, but this psalm also talks about the responses of the Lord. Now, before we go on to the response of the Lord, I I, I do want to say, this isn't to say that righteous people can't or shouldn't take proper legal action when and where it's available. When we say that we're just committing ourselves to the Lord, we're not saying that 
you can't take appropriate action. But ultimately, whether or not we feel that we will get justice in this world, justice in our situation, or justice um, where it is needed, that we as believers are called to be faithful to him, whether or not that justice feels like it's coming or is ever going to come. Our job is to be faithful to what we've been called to do and not to demand that. So anyway, moving on to the, the responses of the Lord. I right, just put them all down in this, that, that God sees, that God saves, and that God sits. He sits on his throne. The psalmist ends his poem by answering, in part, the questions that he raised at the beginning. In verses 14 through 18, he confidently proclaims that God does see the grief that the wicked person has caused. He acknowledges that God will bring that person to account. And he states that there really is no hiding from God. These last five verses declares the psalmist's confidence in God's justice. That God sees the suffering, past and present, of the innocent. And he sees the actions of the wicked. He saves those who commit themselves to him and defends the fatherless and the oppressed. And he acknowledges that God sits on his throne. That God reigns. That God is king forever and ever. He's still in charge, even though it looks like other people are having their way with this world. That even though wicked men act like he's not in charge, that they're in charge, that God still does sit on his throne. And on that throne, he will judge the wicked and he will mete out justice. Now, these things are true about God. And they really should be the source of comfort for everybody who loves him. That no matter what we're facing, that should be a source of comfort for us. That that God sees our affliction. God sees the mess that's happening in our world today. He's not blind to it. He hears our prayers. He's still in control and he will do something about it. That should be a source of comfort and joy for us. At the same time, those truths should be a source of terror in the hearts of people who commit evil. That God does see what they're doing. And eventually, at some point, he is going to judge them for that and hold them accountable for their actions. And his judgment will be firm and it will be final. And in some ways, that's what we should take out of this. That no matter what's going on in this world, that God sees, God saves, and God's still in control. See, at the end of the day, though, in the psalm here, Nothing has really changed. Evil men are still out there. They're arrogantly and brazenly doing what they do and seemingly succeeding in life. And the righteous people are still left to call upon God for help in the midst of their oppression. So typically... What we would say is, what was our takeaway? What is our our action points for this? How how should we respond? You might hear people say that we just, we need to trust in God's sovereignty. Knowing that he will ultimately judge the wicked for their actions. Or that we need to be patient in the midst of suffering. That we need to turn the other cheek. We need to be forgiving. That we need... As Psalm 73 says, 
to not be envious of the successes of the wicked. Or we need, as Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, to seek first God's kingdom and let everything else kind of fall into place, that he'll provide and take care of all the rest. And then lastly, a typical takeaway would be that we need to be faithful in spite of all the wickedness around us. We need to do the right thing even when it's not popular or even when it doesn't seem to advance us. And yes, all those things are absolutely true. You need to take away those, those facts. Those are ways that we should respond to evil in this world. But if you'd permit me to be just a little honest, a little raw uh, when it comes to this, those things sometimes to me, and I think for some of you too, feel maybe just a little too passive. Maybe they just feel sometimes a little too, I don't know, fatalistic. Yay, we win in the end, right? We, we say that. And that is true, and that is a hope that we have. But sometimes in this life, saying we win in the end doesn't feel like it's enough. Either because we still want God's justice here and now, or because we want to be doing something. Like we know that God has called us to do something. So forgive me if this doesn't sounds right to you. Please hear me out. The Bible does teach that we are to be doing something in the midst of this. That we do win in the end, but there's a reason we win in the end. So here's my little twist to this. To what we can do as a church. What we can do as the body of Christ. To deal with the wickedness that we face. So again, I'm not saying that the, the trust in God and being patient in the midst of suffering and all those other things, being faithful, are not. Those are still true. We still need to do that. But here's the twist of how we can do that and put it into action. If you have your Bible, turn to Matthew 16. You know, here at, our, at EBC, we often talk about... Uh, the Great Commission, that our job is to go and make disciples. We talk about the Great Commandment. You know, that's what's on the wall of our church, to honor God and to love people. But Matthew 16 is often what is referred to as the Great Confession. So in verses uh, 13 through uh, 18, and they're up here on the screen. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. The great confession is that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. He is the Savior. And the gates of hell will not overcome the church. It's that confession that Jesus is the Christ that the church is built upon. 
and we may be beaten and battered on every side. Our beliefs and our values may come under attack. Our integrity may be called into question. We may be physically attacked or persecuted or scorned or lied to or lied about. Our rights and our freedoms may be taken away. Justice may seem to elude us, but the church of God will stand. Why will the church of God stand? Remember, the church, that's made up of us, those who claim to know Jesus, who follow Jesus, who trust in Jesus. Why will the church of God stand? Will it be because we stood up for ourselves and we stood up for our own rights? No. Will it be because we won a Supreme Court case? No. Will it be because we all declared we win in the end? Well, I don't know, yes, maybe, sort of, kind of, but not really. The church of God will stand when the church faithfully declares that Jesus is the Christ. When we as a church put Jesus at front and center, and we don't look to this world and feel like we have to be the one to judge this world, when we don't talk about people's behavior and lifestyles and everything else, which are things that are against what we hold to be true and what we hold to be believed. But we talk about Jesus. It's not our job to change people's hearts and lifestyles. It's our job to talk about Jesus. And let Jesus be the one to impact their heart and change their lifestyle. We as a church, as a, when I say church, not just EBC, as a big cultural church, we put the cart before the horse and we think people's lifestyles have to change before they come to Christ. They need to hear about Christ. And we need to let them respond to Jesus. And let Jesus be the one who changes their hearts. So yeah, the wicked are going to prosper in this world and they're going to oppress and they're going to afflict pain and they're going to do other things. And yes, we will call upon God to do something, and we will trust that he will. But in the midst of that, we need to proclaim Christ. That is what it means to be faithful in the midst of this, is to be faithful to be proclaiming Christ. Yeah, we, we need to certainly stand up and defend the rights of those who are being oppressed. But that is not our first and foremost calling. We need to talk about Jesus and let people respond to him. And then let him work out all the other details. And that's our New Testament reply to this. We do win in the end. I love that. But in the meantime, we still have a job to do as a church. And getting people to change their attitudes about abortion, about abortion or their, their sexual identities or anything else is not going to be what changes hearts. It's going to be Jesus that changes hearts. And from there, we'll see things changing in our culture. Pray with me. Father, we want to be a church that is faithful to, to what you've called us to do. And God, we recognize that in the midst of, of this wicked world, in the midst of oppression, in the midst of chaotic, just morals being turned upside down, we just wonder what's going on. We want you to intervene.
But while you are patient, while you are extending mercy, God, help us to be people who are faithful to talk about Jesus, to not focus on our pain, to not focus on our oppression, but to focus on you. And in that, we trust that your sovereign will will reign ultimately. That all that we go through is for our benefit and for your glory. Help us to be a faithful church in the name of Jesus.